Apple's new M3-powered 14-inch MacBook Pro has pulled the plug on its younger sibling, the 13-inch MacBook Pro. This act of fratricide would be horrific if it were not for the sigh of relief we collectively felt when we heard the other bit of news. The touch bar is also gone. But that's not the end of the story. While the M3 line brings some performance upgrades, the M3 Pro and M3 Max versions also introduce the new color, Space Black. Yeah, I know, it's more grey than black, but there's a really fascinating reason for that. For years now, Apple has been spiffing up its cases using an electrochemical process called anodization. Anodizing a surface is effectively growing a protective layer of microscopic bumps which can be combined with dyes to make some pretty cool colours. Cool colours, yes, but nothing close to black. The finish that resulted from this process was too glossy, which in turn makes it look more grey than black. In Apple's never-ending pursuit of aesthetic perfection, the company went a step further on the new MacBook Pro by etching the anodized bumps down to varying heights. This causes the visible light that hits the case to bounce off at different angles, effectively diffusing that light and creating a matte finish. The matte finish is key to keeping a case dyed black from appearing too grey. At certain angles, it still does look grey, but it's understandable why Apple is excited about this colour. They put a whole lot of R&D into achieving it. But enough about the science of anodization. we're not here to just look at the outside of this device. If you would like to learn more about anodization, we wrote a whole blog post about it, and the link will be in the description below. Before I open this thing up, let's x-ray our way inside the 14-inch MacBook Pro M3 Pro. This dual fan version comes with 18GB of unified memory and the new M3 series is manufactured using TSMC's cutting edge 3 nanometer process. You won't find chips this efficient from any other company this year because Apple bought out the entire production run. It's nice to be Tim Cook. The lower spec MacBook Pro M3 doesn't pull as much power and only needs one fan. The engineers were able to shorten the heatsink and expand the logic board to take the space where the second fan went. The base model we bought only comes with 8GB of RAM, which isn't going to age well. More on that later. The opening process is unchanged, but now that Apple is publishing service manuals, this time around I'm using their process for removing the bottom cover. Inserting a spudger between the hinge and gently prying helps slide the cover out of its locked position. From here, it's just a matter of working my way around with a pick to undo the last few clips. A side-by-side -side of the M3 Pro and M3 clearly shows the differences in design. The modular ports on each are mostly the same with a single glaring absence of a Thunderbolt port on the base M3 model. Once inside, the first thing I want to remove is the battery connection. Apple is still using this annoying flimsy copper tab screwed into the positive and negative terminals on the battery management system. That tab is unlikely to cause a problem the first few times you take it apart, but metal fatigue is a thing. Bend this too far, or bend it enough times, and it will break off. I'd love to find out why they chose this design over a simple press connector. The stretch release pull tabs are all placed in the usual spots as in previous models. I'm going to go ahead and remove a few under the trackpad, then I can loosen all the tabs around the battery. The next thing to remove is the logic board, and that means disconnecting a whole bunch of ZIF connectors and several press connectors. With a few more supporting screws out, the logic board comes out without much hassle, and gives us a first good look at the M3 Pro SoC. What's interesting here is that this 512GB board has two flash storage modules on each side of the board, which means we've probably got 128GB of flash storage per module. If you're curious to find out what else is on here, we'll link our chip ID in the description. The remainder of the chassis is quite modular, and everything but the SD card and HDMI ports are independently replaceable. The same applies to the lid angle sensor in the corner, mirrored by the Touch ID sensor on the opposite side. Unfortunately, both of these parts are paired with the logic board, and can't be replaced unless you go through Apple's approved avenues. The base model M3 board is pretty interesting, but it does have a couple of drawbacks when compared to the M3 Pro. Let's take a look at storage first. On the upside, we have two flash storage modules, which means the read-write speed bottlenecks plaguing the base model M2 Airs should be gone. This is good, and it's also great that the base model comes with a practical 512GB of storage. The problem is the measly 8GB of RAM that's incorporated into the SoC. 
That means if you buy the 8GB version, you're stuck with the 8GB version. Now, Apple's dynamic caching does do a great job of handling day-to-day -day tasks, but in the short time that I had testing the system, I managed to fill up seven of those eight gigabytes within the first 15 minutes. That might not be a problem today, but as the OS continues to grow and software demands on memory continue to increase, you might find your system starting to chug. Worse yet, once the RAM fills up on the SOC, it'll start using what's known as swap space on the slower SSD. SSDs have a limited number of read-write cycles, and just like lithium-based batteries, the more it's taxed, the sooner it's going to die. And here's the rub. The SSD is also soldered to the board, so when it fails, you've not only lost your data, but you're left with a computer that needs a very expensive repair. Apple has designed themselves into a bit of a corner here. Thanks to the unified memory architecture that integrates the RAM into the SoC, an upgrade is simply not an option. That's not just a problem in this MacBook. The Mac Pro doesn't even have upgradable memory anymore. For now though, once you buy the 8GB version, you're stuck with the 8GB version. Mechanically, this is a very robust device. But if it breaks, can you fix it? This wouldn't be a modern Apple device if we didn't have some kind of calibration or parts pairing issue to contend with. If you follow this channel, you'll know that Apple has systematically serialized most components inside its electronics and paired them to the logic board. Every device is restricted in a slightly different way. On this MacBook, one of the major things we're locked out of is screen repairs. I swap displays between two MacBook Pros and straight away we can see a problem. We don't know of any way to fix this artifacting without Apple's calibration software, which is only available if you buy a replacement screen from Apple. We've previously investigated this issue on the M1 and M2 MacBook Pros, and a link to that story is in the description if you want to find out more. So what else is locked down? Well, the Touch ID sensor and the Lit Angle sensor are both paired to the logic board. Why on earth would you need to pair a lit angle sensor to the logic board? I don't know, but it's really frustrating. As far as we're concerned, the screen artifacting and the lit angle sensor are both now parts pairing issues because Apple refuses to fix the problem or even acknowledge the problem. All in all, any of these MacBook Pros with at least 16 gigabytes of RAM should serve you well for the foreseeable future. But as far as repairability and sustainability goes, we continue to see Apple lock down and obstruct any attempt at bringing their devices within the realm of a circular economy. Even with the MacBook Pro's relatively modular design, it's hard to recommend this product while Apple has a stranglehold on repairs. We do expect that Apple will release manuals and parts through the self-service repair program. With all that in mind, we're giving the MacBook Pro M3 Pro a provisional score of 4 out of 10. Check out our website for score updates and to learn how you can get involved with Right to Repair where you live.